that's the part we want people to listen to because a new war is going to come soon and you have to be prepared for it again. Pam, <laughs> Pam McKay, welcome to Passion Harvest. I can't wait to have a conversation and chatting with you today. Welcome. Welcome to you. I have so look forward to this meeting. You Me won't believe it. And I thought everything was going to go wrong, but everything has just fit into place. Perfect. So, my, You're a bundle um, of joy and I can't stop smiling talking to you. Okay. Um, we have a lot to okay. cover today. We have a lot. But for, for the audience, let's start with your, if you feel comfortable, with your near-death experience. Yep. Right. Right. Near-death experience. Um, I'm a suicide survivor. Um, I had a very bad bringing up and I thought marriage would be my saviour. So I got married at 16. Um, I had my first child. I was absolutely beaten unrecognisable. It was a bad, bad, bad place. So the only thing in them days, there was no one to help, um, was, you know, mother said, oh, well, you made your bed, you lie in it, but it didn't give me no choice. I mean, that 16 years ago was was like 11-year-old kid. You know what I mean? Um, so so that's where I was, and, and then I just know where to go. So... I planned it all. I laid in bed. I caught, caught me and put all my best clothes on. And the children had been gone to, uh, to, you know, to a party and that. I knew my husband wasn't going to be on to five. So I started taking tablets. But as you know, when you take tablets, they're trying to come back up. But I kept talking and talking and kept them down. Um, finally, I went to sleep. And he was... It was something that I have never, never experienced before. It was like um, I wasn't quite there, and I wasn't. You know what I mean? The casual. I think I was in between worlds. And then all of a sudden, I was coming back round, and I could hear an ambulance in the background, and and I was just going along along with the noise. And then I found myself being picked up and plunked down. And then I felt my chest absolutely caving in with, because they put these things on me to start me out beating. And I heard this, this young girl saying, we've lost her, there's no heartbeat. But by that time, I was stood watching. I wasn't stood on the floor. I was just stood there watching. And then all of a sudden, I heard this beautiful voice saying, are you ready, Pamela? And I turned round and everything from behind vanished and everything opened with the music that you just couldn't comprehend. And you would have followed that music wherever it went. And people were coming and, and touching me and holding me and said, you're safe now, you're safe. And there was holding me and cuddling me and I had so much love and there was so much compassion. Um, I just went with the flow, but I always felt this, this, I'll say a person by the side of me. And then as I was going, going down with them, I noticed all these flickering, flickering lights coming in, very small ones. And I'm talk, talking to this person, I'm saying, what are all these lights? There's green, there's reds, there's oranges, but not the colours you see on this earth are completely different. And he says, Pamela, he said, they're the only ones that call me Pamela, by the way. Um, these, these is how we recognise each other here. Because we have no body, um, we are what you call an energy, an energy ball. And you can doubt from every, you know, whatever. Well, that's what they were doing. So he started telling me the colours and what colours meant. Luckily, when I, when I come round later on, I remembered every colour that they told me. And it was such a long thing. It's incredible. So I'm going along and, and he's talking to me. Then all of a sudden, everything, vibration, boom, 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 boom. And I'm thinking, what's, what's going on? And I started panicking. And this, this view of this person, whatever she was, just come into view. And she was like, everything was wrapped, wrapped around the face like a cloud and she seemed to have wings but I think she didn't you know what I mean I was getting confused and she said to me 
Pamela, you must go back. And I said, you are bloody joking. I couldn't believe. I begged. I remember going on my aunt's knees and begging her to let me go. And she was talking to me. She said, your journey hasn't finished. We, we're asking you to go back because she said, we would like you also to do something for us. I said, I'm not interested. I don't want to go back. Anyway, all of a sudden she said, I promise you, this is the last word, I promise you a wonderful life within two years. I promise you that. And that promise like vibrated through my brain, like all that took everything. And then all of a sudden I was back on the table. And I heard someone say, I got an heartbeat. I got an heartbeat. Then everything started happening and this I felt an injection going in me because I felt, a, you know, a prick. And I felt then this machine coming on me and I felt so bloody miserable from what I'd come from. You just wouldn't believe it. So if you, if people want to know what death's about, it's a beautiful experience and not to be afraid. Not, not everybody goes out the same way. Though, I've got to tell you that. So here I am and, and I'm back on this bloody earth. And it was um, it was a few months later when things started to go into place. And I got a letter from a, a, a family member that had been in Australia for years and years and years, never heard from her. And she said, would you like to come to Australia? And I thought, my God, this is my way out. But you see, what happens is in when you've done a suicide or a thing, you lose, you lose the power of your children. Then I realized I've got a guide. I had a guide because every time I wanted to do something, somebody was talking to me. So I've got a beautiful guide and his name is his name is Fred. But it's not Fred. I picked the name. It's uh, Francisco. Da, 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 and it went on for bloody miles, his name. So I just said, could I call you Fred? And he said, yes. Now, Fred is the next thing to, best thing to everything. He knows where we go and he shows me where to go. He's directing me to buying houses and selling houses. He's directed me to go to America. And he said, I'm going to America uh, in, in six months time. And I said to my husband, we're going to America. He said, oh no, I don't go to America, my husband said. And they told me to get book a flight for the 12th of April. I booked a flight for the 12th of April. We put the house on the market. We put it out for five fifty. Three weeks later, my guy said, take it off the market. And I said, he's joking. I just put it on. He said, take it off the market. So I took it off the market, left it off for three weeks. And he told me to go down and get fresh people and put, put the property on the market again. I was thinking, oh, God, what's going on? So anyway, we get the valuation with three different people. The first was was uh, um, 550. And then all these three people come and said, it was worth 650. And I, I said to my husband, they must be doing it to just to get the, you know, the, the chance of selling it. But true to the word, two days, two days later, he come back with, a, with um, an offer. But he said, there's one condition. You have to leave, the, leave here, leave the house on the 12th of April. Well, we booked the flight for the 12th of April, six months prior to that, because I knew something was going to go on. So Fred got me to do the booking. So this is where my guides, I've left one situation, and this is how my guides guide me to different things in my life. The, the trip to America was a book award I'd won. Didn't even know I'd won it. I wrote this book, Sleep Never Comes. I took it to my dentist and the lady said, oh, can I read the book? And she said, yeah. She said, I'm going to America. And I said, oh, I'll drop it back off later. It's no problem. So she took it to America and her husband thought it was the most fantastic book he'd ever read. And he put it into a competition. And it was, um, then a few, a few months later, we had a phone call to say, would you like to come to Miami? So I'm thinking Miami and in Australia. Oh, no, she said, in, in, in Miami, in Florida. I said, what do I want to come there for? She said, we won an award. I said, what well, award should your book sleep never comes? So anyway, so, so this is how all things have worked 
for me and my husband all the way through. We are guided to do things and we bought our first house that way. We bought our second house that, that way. We bought our third house by, this house is a beautiful home, but it was never on the market. And I was going up there one day and I drove past and I saw this really sad house with a real sad garden. And Fred said, go and knock on the door. And I said to my husband, I'm going to knock on the door and see if they're going to sell it. My husband's really straight. No, you can't do that. I said, you can't do that. I said, what well, am I going to do? I got no choice. I got to knock on that door and walk down the path, knocked on the door. This woman shouted, who's the bloody house the door? I just went open the door and the door went back in. And I'm thinking, what am I doing here? Anyway, he opened the door and I said, I'm sorry to bother you. I just wondered if you thought about, um, I was ready to run mine. Ready, I wondered if you thought about selling your property. Well, let's go to my church. I'll tell you what happened. That bloke just stood and he, there was a gold light all the way around him. I'm thinking, what the hell's that mean? And then the woman that was sitting here shouted in, does she want to buy the house, bring her in? And my husband won't come in because he was embarrassed. But anyway, the old fellow went down and got him and brought him in. We bought the house that day. My guy said, you will move in the house precisely three weeks' time. My settlement agent said, can't be done. My guy said, I'll show you how it's done. So he told me that every piece of paper that I sign, I take it to the office and I pick it up from the office. So there's no post involved. It was that quickly done. And we moved in here. So there's, that's, you know, whatever. I've gone out and I said to Paul, oh, I'd love, I'd love a motor home. And I think I'd never be able to afford a motor home. And the bloody thing comes to our doorstep. I mean, it's it's the world I live in for me is everything that they promised to do. And I've kept my bargain up because I have listened to, um, I've written, this is a list of the books. Now, when I write a book, I don't write one book, I write five books, but I can write five books in two and a half days. Now, what happens is, I've got sleep never comes, come butterflies cry, the whispering souls, death comes in no choice, the caretaker of souls, Memories from the past, a letter of hope, a place to die, a lifetime of memories, the shadow children, stories from the other side, let's talk about dying, the gift, the storyteller, I don't know, love never dies, dancing butterflies is, is shy, children is beautiful, tells you how people, how children die and how they accept it. It's a beautiful story. Death is but an instrument, but life is a miracle. Just one day. Cries from the soul to life has no more meaning. He forgot to remember. That's the story. Um, is there a life after death, a promise of tomorrow, and a ghost in the afterlife? Now, The Promise of Tomorrow is a book that um, I'd listened to all these soldiers coming through, and they told me they take me onto the battlefield. And I'm sitting there with them and I watch them break a cigarette in half and share it. I watch this soldier writing a le his last letter to his, his, to his wife. He's asking about little boy that's just got two teeth. And he's going through the, the things, I can smell all the smell that he can smell, I can hear the shots and, um, and everything. And, and it's just such a beautiful experience. But then when I put these three soldier books into the books where babies die or mothers die, the, a soldier came to me one day when I was in the office and he says, of course, he's a dead one. He said, excuse me, he said, but there's five of us here and we'd like to ask you a question. And I said, okay. He said, we would like you to put all our stories into one book so people can read what one book with all our stories in and i said oh okay okay so i said what would you like to name the book he, we, he said we've picked a name and it's called the promise a promise of tomorrow and i said why did you call it a promise of tomorrow he says because when we all joined up i was 14 someone said i was 16 None of us was older than 16. 
but we'd never had a pair of boots. And we went to this, this bloke come to town and he was enlisting young boys and they told us we'd have three square meals a day. He said, we'd have new boots. And he said, you know, we, we never had, some of us never had boots in his life and we had new boots. And we, and they said, and you'd fly in airplanes. We thought, my God, what a good life. But they didn't tell us how to kill somebody and how to sit there and watch our friends die. And we can't do anything about it. That's the part we want to talk to you about. That's the part we want people to listen to because a new war is going to come soon and you have to be prepared for it again. Um, so, so, so I did write the book and it is finished. It's, uh, it's got to be checked over and, you know, all the things before it goes out to press. Um, but that's called The Promise of Tomorrow. So every book that I write, whoever comes to tell me the story, I have got 51 A4s and I've got all the stories full all the way down. So there's 51 of those with hundreds and hundreds of different stories. I get, just, am I all right still to talk? Yes. Yeah? Yes, ab okay. Absolutely. And then I'll we ask you some questions. <laughs> yeah. Well, Tom, ask you questions and then we'll, we'll go back on. I'll tell you about reincarnation then. Um, so. First of all, congratulations, 23 books. That's amazing. I just want to backtrack a little bit from what you've said. Next. Thank you for go sharing for that. that. Your spirit guide, Fred. Yeah. I love the guidance. For many of the audience, me included, would like to connect more with our spirit guides and I believe we all have Fine. one. What is your advice? Well, I'll tell you about them first. First of all, we're all born with a guide, one main guide that goes through all eternity with us, okay? So we've got this one guide. He sees us then, he sees us back. Now, when you're doing work like I do, I'm a healer. I do free healing, never charge anybody. So I have a special healer. And um, he's a cuckoo of a guy. He's he's a Japanese short guy, and he comes in. He always trips over something, and uh, he's a lovely guy, lovely feeling. But he's a healer, and he helps healing. And then I've got another uh, guide called um, Cloasis. Now Cloasis comes in because I used to do predictions about what was going on with the world. He predicted that. Thousands of birds would fall from the sky in every country in one day, in one hour, in one minute. And I couldn't figure that out. And I didn't want to put it on my, um, I was just learning them. I used to have my own website and I used to put things what Chloe has said. So about, oh, it would have been a good six months after that, my friend phoned up and she said, turn the ABC on. And I went and turned it on. And the first thing I heard was thousands of birds fell from the sky. And I thought, bloody hell, I wish I'd have put it on now. I doubted, you see, and I never doubt now. And what it was, if you look up, black, all birds fall all in, in where was it, in England, uh, Ireland, in Australia, in America, uh, all the cities, thousands of birds fall from the sky and were found in the water floating. And I said to I said, because I my I ask my friend everything. I said, how can that be possible? Because if you drop something from an airplane, it will only go down in that certain space. He said, think, Pamela, think. And I said, Well, I don't know what else. He said, think, stop a minute and think. What's the highest point that you could throw something down and it would it's all the five to seven countries? I said, you'd have to go in a bloody rocket, wouldn't you? He said, there you go. I said, well, what, why do they do it? Why do they do that then? He said, it's, it's chemicals. And so when they're letting chemicals off and it goes through all the countries, and you'll believe this now because it's, everything's happening in this world that's not good. But in that time, you see, um, they, they invented all this chemical. And so the first thing that ever got got breathing the chemical was a bird because he was flying he say highest then the bird died and he got burned and he was in fell 
uh, and some were found found in water, some was found in whatever. But there was, if you Google that, thousands of birds fall from the sky. You'll see that I predicted about two years or something like that before that time. I've also predicted about the um, injection, the the cover. I did that. I didn't have it, and I don't want it, and I shouldn't be telling you that, but I didn't. But anyway, um, so, but you use your guides, so that's, so that I've got, um, so that's Cloasis, and, and I've got a, a fantastic guy. He's eight foot tall, and he's got rings around his neck, and he, he, he was, his thing was to carry me across a certain part of the world where I needed to go, not our world, their world. He'd carry me because that was his job and he'd place me down there and I would then realise that there was another part of something else going on in the afterlife. Do you know what I mean? So everything they do is like a learning process. Um, we just don't die. And we just don't go here. And we just don't do that. And it's not a place where um, there's big boys, little boys and, and things. There's no, it's love. There's no, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Nobody can be better than anybody else. We're all quality. equal. Quality. But it's that quality that's different up there than it is here. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and if you're lucky enough to have passed away, and you've been bloody lucky enough to be given a gift like I've got. And I swear, the, all the things, I, I, I never went to school because I stuttered. So I'm, I'm very illiterate, can't spell bloody. And they give me this beautiful job to write the stories down. And I'm thinking, how the hell I can't spell now today? But they said, trust. And that's what I did. I trusted. I used to write in pencil because they they called it, people on earth called it automatic writing. So I questioned Fred one day and I said, well, am I doing automatic writing? He said, no, you're not Pamela. I said, well, I need a name to put on what I do. And he leaned back and he said, you're a memory catcher. Oh, I, I said, what's that. a memory catcher? A memory catcher. So I said, what's a memory catcher? He said, well, you, you've had, you've been given, and someone else, he said a big word, I don't understand big word, said the opportunity to go into people's memories and listen to the stories. Because what the stories you write is through their memories, when they've been on the war field, when they've done this, when they've done that. So um, now I was, I'm called the memory catcher, but... I had jumped to that part yet, so I'm just a bit of everything at the moment. I don't put a thing on me, what I do or what I do. I just know I'm bloody lucky. Um, and I try and help everybody I can, and I try not to charge anything for anything I do. Sometimes I get a bit caught when I, we all need a little bit of cash. But um, I try to be as straightforward as I can. I love talking and I love teaching. I, he said I was going to be a teacher. When I come back from Australia, I'm still there and, he, and I got this house that they give us. And I said, what am I going to do? And he said, you're going to be a teacher. I said, you're bloody joking. I don't know about life. Never mind death. He said, you won't need to. So he said, put a little advertisement in your local paper. You'll get 14 people answer. And I'm talking to my husband. I'm saying I can't do this. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm don't know enough about it. So then guy, Fred would come in and say, shh, 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 "Have faith." So I put the advertisement in. I got fourteen people, like he said. I got changed all my house up to put all these people around. I sat at the top of the table, and my knees shook. I was so scared, and I thought, "How am I going to start?" And then this lady asked. Clayton said, asked a question, and boof, I was gone. They took over, and Fred was asking, all, answering all these questions, as he does now, because I'm only a person. I'm, I haven't had that experience that they've had, so 
even when uh, people are dying in front of me um, and they're telling me their stories, I'm learning every day. I'm learning how they died and why they died, but most of all, why they want to come back. So it's took me a long time to, um, to learn and sometimes, sometimes, um, sometimes it gets too much for me and I, and and I start crying because some of the stories are so bad, so sad, yeah. um, especially about children. And the children come and put their arms around me and say, thank you very much, thank you, and they kiss me on the cheek. I mean, I, I can describe every person that comes through, I can describe them. I can describe how they feel when they're there, how they had, what kind of life they had before and after. So I get all this, but once I've told the story, it's like you release them from a little bit of the self so they can be complete at the other side. Do you understand what That's, I mean? Yes, it's 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 beautiful. Um yeah. so how do you with your spirit guides, how do they how, how do you communicate with them? Is it is it I, through hearing? Is it I'll leave you to answer that. Talk to them. See, when the only You've got to put in to get out. You've got to really put in. I meditate every day of my life for 15 to 20 minutes. That's important. And I let myself go. And I let them come in. I open myself up, but I also keep myself clear from anything else that comes. So I put a protected shield around me. And then I lay there and I say, go for it. Bang. Everybody comes in. And why, 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 why? You know, so... I'm happy with them. They're happy with me. They know they can come and go. We've got used to each other, but it's trust. Right. You have to learn to trust. And you have to, do you know what? You need imagination. And, and, and I was on a show not long ago, and this blog made it sound like it was cheap. I said, if you had not got imagination, you can't imagine somebody stood by the side of you. And that's what you've got to do. So, the lady that came this week, she's lost her husband. She was devastated. She wanted to finish herself off. And I said, he's there behind you. She said, how do you know? I said, because he's got a stupid smile on his face. And I said, he's, he's doing this. And I, and I said, and he's telling me about the striped cardigan that you got in your bedroom. She said, no, I just bought that today. She said, he's telling you. So, so I help and then to comfort them. They always give me something to tell them or something to say. But majority of people, if I say, if you've lost a loved one, the easiest way to find comfort, first of all, is to go and get a jumper that belonged to them, a shirt belonging to them, or something that belongs to them so you can hold it at night time, put it on your pillar and smell them. That's the first comfort that we can accept because we're frightened to accept something that we don't know. Then when we get a bit short of a self, and that's what you've got to, you know, you've got to do, um, then you invite them in and you visualize them being there. And now I'm visioning somebody's knocking in and saying, you're doing a good job here. <laughs> that's <laughs> well, lovely. And, and, sorry. Go on, no, go on. Uh, tell so me. how the 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 souls that have transitioned or died, how do you do you see them with your physical eyes? How do they, no, how do they appear to you? Ear. Okay. I see them in here. It's like um uh when I do when I do a story, they take me through their memories. So I'm actually tuned into their what whatever you call it, brain, whatever not telepathy, I guess. We could. Yeah. And and I I uh, it's like when you connect, it's like wow, factor. You know, I still, I I still want to connect to people that tell the stories, because I get that wow factor that gives me boof energy. I mean, you don't believe I can do anything. You know what I mean? If I put my turn and say I need help, I can do anything. I can drive a tractor through too. But my husband had a tractor, and he said, "Don't go through there. Don't go there. Not drive it." Precisely through there, and that's the first time anybody ever did it. You, do you know what I mean? It's it's because you join their world, 
you get more confidence in yourself of what you and not compare not 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 um got the energy to do but, but they help you do, you do you know what i mean yes um, I, as you said trust uh, you know the more you trust, trust yourself and establishing these relationships you mentioned they show you what happened in in while they were alive what we term as alive yeah. and what happens when they die what what happens when we die um, well, I can just cut it, cut it short, but it's not short. I could turn around and say, well, you close your eyes and you open them and you're, somebody else, you're with someone else. But it's not like that because everybody dies differently because we are all different people. Some accept it, some don't. Some, I, I had a, a, a bloke on, on the thing the other day and he says, um, oh, well, what happens when I die? And I'm not a believer. And my guy come in and said, You'll believe when you take your last breath. Mm. Do you understand? Because when you take your last breath, it's like, first of all, I can give you the first answer where is that you've nowhere to go. So you, you cling on to that fact that there is something on the other side. But in that same instant, the other side comes in and saying, you're fine, you're gone. So no matter where you do, how you die, is, is an individual thing. We don't all die the same because we're not all the same type of people. And 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 that's you know that's and, and and children, we don't give them credit enough to, you know, we lose a father or a brother or an aunt and cousin, and we're young kids about five to seven, and we usher them away, or we just let them say, you explain to the kids. Because the kids, are, children are not stupid. They know something's happening. They know they're going to a funeral. Explain it to them. Let's say that this is what happens and this is, you know, because I get a lot of children come back and they say, I love my nana, but my, my dad wouldn't let me go and see her. And I wanted so desperately to see her. And these are the things that children come back. They tell me about their afterlife. They tell me how they die. And they say, I, I had I had a little boy come in the other day and, and he's saying, Mommy doesn't know I'm there. I said, you have to give her time, sweetie. He said, I put her, my arms around her like I used to do, but she doesn't know I'm there. I kiss her on the cheek and she doesn't know I'm there. Aww. And I said, well... I should get my tissue box so now. <laughs> I know, that's one thing I got. But, you know, by the time you've talked to that child and you've exchanged, you're more, you're more enlightened by listening. And that's what it's all about. It's about listening, learning. And if you had got the opportunity to experience, experience the changeover on someone's death or like that, then it's different. I, as you can see, I'm always full of energy. I, I you're, you're a bundle of energy. <laughs> I know. I can't. I can't help it. It's, it's um. And if I get started, well, oh, tell me about this. Tell me about that. So there's always somebody coming in, talking to me, saying, tell me about this, tell me about that. So have I missed anything out? No, you haven't. For those, and many of us are, for those that are afraid of dying, what is your or afraid of death? What is your advice? Well, let's put it this way. When I, before I did my suicide, I'd heard all, my family die when they're ready. I don't know why it is, they just die. But then we had, my grandma told me a story where my auntie was dead, that was supposed to die and they brought her back up and she was still living. And it frightened the shit out of me. And I didn't want to die. I was so scared something was going to happen to me like that. Um, but it's not like that. It's it's such a beautiful it's such a beautiful um, everything goes everything goes slow you know when when you're starting to pass away everything starts slowing down for you and it just gets starts preparing you to to do the changeover and 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 then you'll see an aunt and an uncle coming in and then you'll see somebody else somebody else coming in and then you feel like everything's going to be okay. And then, then you'll get that little thought again is, oh, my God, I'm trying to pull back out of death. And then suddenly, okay, everything's fine. And there's talk to you. And, the, 
and they're talking is like, you can't stop going. You go with them because you would go anywhere in this God's damn world to listen to the voice to take you in. It's not scary. It's the most beautiful experience you'll ever feel. But then when you get over there, wow, it's a completely different life again. So you, you're special on this earth and you're special over there because you're still individuals over there. Um, and you you still, it's a learning. If you've been sick, that's a different thing. If you've been a murderer, then that's a different thing. So there's lots and lots to, to spirit world. There's a lot of uh, little nooks and crannies. Um, as I said, I've learned through writing a book about a murderer. And I, my guy said, the only way I will learn of his suffering after death is to go with him. Oh, my God, I would never, never, ever do anything wrong that I'd go to a place like that. So, anyway, anything else? Are there? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've got lots of questions. I just didn't want to interrupt you. What then? Why in our humanness, are so many, so many people suffer, and we experience so much conflict and contrast. Right, we only suffer because we bring it on ourselves. You know, we are born. You know, people say, um, "Oh, kids are horrible kid. He's, 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 he, he, he beats people up and he murders." It didn't start off like that. When that when that when that murderer was born, you know, was born, he was a tiny little baby. He had a pure of heart, pure of mind, but it's the parents and the bringing up that changes a child. So you can remember, think that's really serious. So it's like um, I got a friend, and she's not a very good mother, and 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 the kids have grown up with that type of thing, and I think what a shame because they started off good. We started off pure and simple, and we change them. We change them to what we want them to be. Do you understand? And if we haven't got the time to be with them, a majority of people are on the phone today, which is no good for communication. That's why so many people are doing suicides. There's no communication with people anymore. And we need people. We need hugs. And we need reassurance. So... That is the main, that is the only thing I say when people ask me, you are your child. You are the one that brings it up. You're the one that tells it it's good and the bad of things. And if your child turns out good, it's because you've put the time in. Do you understand? Do you agree well, with that? I agree for the most part. Why then? Many people say, I well, never. I know, I know. Let's let, well, most part, you to you, you. I, well, not for the most part. It, it's my belief that yeah. we choose to incarnate and we choose our parents for life lessons. No. No? No. Okay. No, no. Well, I'd be really interested to hear your... Um... Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, how much time have we got? Are we all right for time? Okay. Oh, if you, uh, It's up to you. I have no, no, all the no. time. No, I'm not in a hurry. No. no. Reincarnation. Now... Um, when I first heard about reincarnation, I was confused and I wanted to know more about it because it's a topic where you think you're going to come back time and time again or this is going to happen. And because I'd tried to read so much books that confused the hell out of me, I stopped reading. And I said to um, my friend, how, how can I find out about reincarnation? He said, one day somebody will phone you up and you'll be taught that. Oh, I thought, how long have I got to wait? Because that's how I talk to my guy. He said, when the time's right, you will learn. So it would be about six months later and a lady phones me up. And she said, I lost my baby. I lost it, I've carried it, and I lost my baby. And I can't sleep, I can't eat. And the husband said, I don't know what to do with her. So I remembered when I was young, I carried her baby for nine months and I lost her and her name was Tina Jane. So I had a connection. So I said to my friend, 
what happens what happens to babies that you know that die and in, in, in the womb and whatever and about the we kind of she said just take it just stop there he said we will just take it step at a time so he said i'm going to bring you somebody to help you so i'm thinking this big fella or oh, this woman you know, and i go to bed and when I go to sleep, I always put my hand out of the bed. So if anybody wants to come to me, I can feel they put their hand on, on, on me hand. And they tell me what they want. And then I ask my other husband to remember it the following day. Then I write words down and then I do the story. But this this time we're different. I had this tiny stand placed on the palm of my hand. It wasn't warm, it wasn't cold but it was a little touch that you'd remember. And I thought, oh my God, where, where is the story going to take me? Anyway, I was so confused, I woke up and I made a, got a, went to, I had a, maybe, maybe have a cup of coffee and then went back to bed. And then poof, as soon as I went back to bed, I saw this, this little child still in the man's mother's womb and he said, I, I'm coming to tell you my story. And I said, okay. He said, could you just hold your hand out again so I can connect? So I held my hand out and I could feel his little hand in there. And then he said, I'm going to take you on my journey. So he said, I'm in mommy's tummy. And mommy's patted my tummy. And daddy's putting his ear to mommy's tummy and listening to my heartbeat. And he's laughing. And mummy and daddy's very, very happy. And um, this went on for a few times. And and and, and he was saying things. I said, well, how can you see mom, mommy doing that? He said, we don't see. We're still in the womb. Pamela, he said, well, what we do? We feel with vibrations. So I said, oh, okay. No, I wasn't quite grasping that. I don't know, just started the story. So he said, everything that happens in a womb is all by vibrations. We feel by, by vibration and we see by vibrations. If you've got that gift to connect to that stronger, higher vibration. So I'm there watching his mommy older tummy. And then something, I knew something was going wrong because the baby stopped talking and started slurping his words and I'm saying, what's happening? He said, something, something's something's wrong with mummy. And you could feel the I could feel the mummy's body shaking. And he stood it, you know, for a bit of time. He says, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna have to go back to the elders and, and ask what's what's wrong with mummy. So he goes back over and and they're telling that Mummy will die in the next five minutes. She's had an accident. And we advise you stay. And he said, no, I want to go back to mummy. So they say, you realise when you go back to mummy, you will die with mummy. And he said, yes, I will die with mummy. So the child goes back into the mummy's wound and he can feel all this vibration and all these things happening. And then he has doctors and he has his, his daddy and his uh, daddy's it's in the tummy and saying, you're going to be okay, you're going to get okay, we're going to get you out. And then the baby knows that it's not going to make it. But it, they said, do you want? Do you choose to stay with mummy or do you choose? He said, I want to stay, I choose to stay with mummy. So in that next few minutes, they pronounce the mummy dead, but the surgeon goes in to try and save the baby, but they can't save the baby. So the baby's laid on the side of the bed and the mother's passed passed away now. And the mother's just taken a form of a, a cell and she's looking over to where the baby's just been placed. And while these doctors and nurses are doing all the things here, uh, the mummy comes across and she picks the baby up and around and she holds it and cuddles it. And she, she said, how I wanted you to experience the world and all it had to offer. And she gave the baby a kiss on the forehead. And that kiss on the forehead was a connection 
that he would go back with. So he, he went, she went, but she went as he, he said, I know I can't go with mommy because mommy, mommy will go on another journey and I will go back on my journey. So he goes back to his place, she goes back to hers, but he remembered that, that kiss on the forehead. That kiss will bring him back into reincarnation again. So that is how my guide took me on the journey of reincarnation. We don't get to choose the person. We don't get to choose the time. We want this so desperately to come back that we have to wait for that special moment in time when that clicks, this clicks, this clicks, boom. I've got two more questions. Okay, go. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned the soldiers, the book that you were writing. Yeah. They said to you there's a war coming. Yes, there is. There's a war that you would never believe, you'd never understand. And it's not, it will always be, it won't be run by humans neither. Um, the, the, you, you know, um, when he was, when he, when Fred tells me something and he's, and I said, why would people go to war again um, after the last war? Because it's still memories. And I said, and besides, if you get a person to pull out a gun, and to look somebody in the eye, nine out of ten, they won't shoot them. But you get a robot to pull a gun out and shoot them. A robot has got no emotions. Emotion. It was a shoot. So almost like art AI, artificial intelligence. That's it. And that's what's rats what will eventually start taking over. Nobody's got any jobs anymore. We've got three thirty three hundred and thirty three hundred and thirty-three. Um, people just lost one job. We've got hardly any shops open in the streets. Um, all the tills now are run by automatically until I go in there and demand I get served, otherwise I put all the food back. So I'm I'm one of those people that speak up. But everywhere you look, you're finding more and more. I'm going to write, do a, a book, a new book, and I'm finding that some intelligent thing is actually listening to what I'm saying. And he's, I, you can pick it up on your TV. You think your TV is dead. And then me and my husband were sat there and I was talking to him and I said, well, we'll have to wait, just listen. And in that time, I said a Yorkshire word to slang. And because this television picked it up, but it was a slang word, it said, it turned around and said, um, something about the couldn't understand that word couldn't put that per, per word into perspective that's possible where the hell did that come from um so they're listening to everything that we do um and it's nobody's got time for nobody today you know i brought up in a place where uh, if Mrs. Green down the road wasn't well we'd go down and take some 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 to eat and look after her and that you can walk down the street today and you, people's on the phone, they don't take notice of you. Uh, there's, there's, there's an old lady fall, fell way before I could get to her and everybody just turned around, went on the phone and walked on. This this world, the, 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 they've changed us into non-thinking people. So did you receive Talk. an indication of time frames? Well, I, I would have said at first time, maybe five, six years, but no, I'm seeing it within two, two to four years. Because things that Fred's asking me to get ready, preparing to do, um, it must be something that's coming in really um, in the next, close to the next two years. He told me about banks. Uh, he explained about, you know, I tell you, tell you, you, people, especially your people, get the money out of the banks because there'll be a quiet day come when you won't be able to get the money out of the banks. Now, we we went to draw some money out of the bank to help my son get a car. We needed 10000 We weren't allowed to draw out 10000 We could only draw, draw out 4900 So what I did, I, I drew 4900 out of one bank and went down the road 
to the surface and got nine, uh, the same amount again to get that sum. But now they've wisened up on that, so they're closing all the tools. So there's a, uh, we've only got two two people in one bank now. We've got no tellers that have only got one, you know, the two tellers, but they can't cope with everything that comes. And then when you go to get your bank, you want to go and get to draw some money out, where it used to be a, 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 a mixed bag of notes, old notes and new notes, it's all new notes. Because the new notes are being tagged and they've got a chip in them. And so that's come, that's what Fred told me three years ago, that all the notes would be chipped so that if you had a stack of notes anywhere, the government can use this thing and find out where your statue is in the house by picking up on that. Um, he, said, he said, if you think of it similar as a phone, as, as losing your phone, and you've got a little thing there where you can find your phone, it's just the government uses a similar thing to trace where your money is. So now I'm telling you, I'm going on Facebook and wherever I can, I'm telling people how to and where to put the money, but get the money out because oh, this woman said, I, my husband's going to pull out his super. He's got 75,000 super. But the bloke that's done his buck work all his years told him to top it up with his super. I said, why would you do that? And he, she, he said, so when we do, um, when he does retire, he'll have a lump sum. I said, you're supposed to retire at 65 to put up to 71. I said, what's going to happen to your man? By the time he gets to 71, he wants to kick the bucket or he's too sick to enjoy it. And if he hadn't done that, the government's going to claim it anyway because th that's that's where the world's going. Do you understand? You might think I'm a crank. but that's... No, I don't. I'm interested also. No, you, I know you do future pre predictions and your guide. Closius? Closius? Cloasis. 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 Excuse me. So, so everything, everything that we do, we don't tell everybody everything because um, people, well, when I first told people about three years prior to the Coven, my guide said, I don't want you to go and get a flu injection. Oh, okay. And then I said, well, why not? He said, because I don't want you to. He said, within 12 months, two years, uh, there's, there's a virus coming out that connects to the flu injection. And the flu injection is the only, only uh, chemical that will actually take another chemical and bind it together. I'm not thing in mind when he tells me, so I pick up this one. So I said, well, what is it? He said, it's an injection. And what it does, it puts poison into, into people's systems. But not only that, they've got to, they'll put a, they're have got going to put a chip in there. I said, get away. They can't get a chip chip through a bloody eye of a needle because this is how I talked to my friend. He said, who did you talk to yesterday? I said, my friend. He said, what was your friend going to do in the afternoon? I said, my friend's going to take the dog dog down to be chipped so that the so they can trace it if it gets lost. So Fred said I rest my case. So you see they can put everybody laughed at me and people shunned me and people I've known for a long time thought I was an idiot. But now those same people want to listen to everything I say. So you can put a chip through the eye of a needle. And you see what it is, it's connected to 5G, my guy told me. And the 5G has got so much power that it will collect all the data of this chip that's in people and it will get the blood pressures, the heart pressures, this pressures, that pressures, everything. And not every part of your body that goes. And But when the time comes, the chip will just think and you're gone. And it's another way of getting rid of us. And I don't know whether you, you think that's far-fetched, but if you know what's going on in the country and you know what's going on in the world, now they're talking about getting in the UK, is talking about bringing 
back in where all your children over 14, uh, over 16 goes in the army. And it's going to be compulsory. So why are they now, uh, why is England and Australia's going to do it, getting ready for the next two years and enlisting all our children into the army? What's going on? So should so we be you, afraid of what's coming? We should be shitless. We should be so scared that every move we make from us, what I'm saying about you, every move that you make has got to be calculated for your safety and for your children's safety. And, it, 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 you know, when I said to Fred, do I have to go that far? He said, well, let's so let's face it. If you do it and you're safe, you're safe. If you And it doesn't happen, well, you've made your house safe and you've done this safer, so you've not lost anything. And I said, no. See, we, he told us to stockpile for a month. And we stockpiled all this bloody food. And, and I said, when's this supposed to happen? And he said, wait, patient. Never told you at the time you got away. So I was patient. Then when we went one month, we went to the shopping centre, couldn't get no bloody, we couldn't get no butter, we couldn't get no eggs, we couldn't get no bread, we couldn't get no um, pot porridge for Paul. But we had the sock because we stockpiled. So I shared it between me and uh, my son. We was all right, but it happened for six weeks. There was, you know, no facilities. Um, you, you could get processed food, but you couldn't get the everyday food. Do you know what I mean? So we'd been gone out and we'd got um, dried um, potatoes. Um, we found the potatoes, we mixed them all up. And besides, we got we got two lots of potatoes growing in the garden. We've got all the fruit trees you can imagine in this garden. Apples, pears, peaches, apricots, we've got it all. So we, we, we put them in because Fred said, we'll need them. Now I want to move. And I think he's saying, well, I've done all this. So you'll be safe. You're going to stay there. <laughs> so, so that's, um, that's you've got to, nobody can tell you what to do. But if you've got a big picture of what you think could happen, then you work that to, we was going to go flying the other way to, Queensland, and everything went wrong, what we was going to do. Couldn't get there. Then we were sitting watching TV last night, and there was a massive, well, one of the planes shook that much that it killed one person. It dropped. The, the, the thing, it dropped. It killed one person and injured hundreds. So that could have been the flight that, you know, Paul and I was on. And I said, it's a bloody lucky we didn't fly. So we stopped flying now. Pam, I've loved having yeah. you on the show. Where yeah. is the best place for people to connect with you or well, your website? And I will leave a link right. below in the show notes. Right. I've got, um, I've got a list here. I've got a, um, I've got, is there life after death by Pam McKay on YouTube? So you can watch that on there. Uh, there's an email address of Pam at lifeafterdeath.com.au um there's also i'm on i've got my own spotify um thing where it's the what we got podcast like new where i tell people about myself and about my books and so you've got that that goes under um is there life after death the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth on a final note is there anything you'd like to share with the passion harvest audience that i haven't asked you today um, I think the nicest thing I would be saying is um, I'd like everybody to go back to the way they were and if you see somebody fall, pick them up. If you think somebody needs help, help them. Um, most of all, people love cuddles. If somebody's down or somebody's not well, give them a hug, give them a cuddle because, oh, my God, it, it means such a lot to them. And believe it or not, it means a lot to you because we all need that connection. So... Beautiful, wonderful, so, wonderful, wonderful way to end the show. Nothing like kindness really, and love. 